What's your name? Michael Caps. What's your current job and how many years have you had it? I have had the current job with the Round Rock Express as radio broadcaster for 19 seasons. I've been in baseball for 23. How many years did you spend as a television news reporter? 22. What's your estimate of the number of deaths that you covered in those years? Gosh, Josh. Uh, probably in the 2000 neighborhood, counting airplane crashes. Coming up on this edition of Life Around the Seams, our guest is Mike Caps. He had the type of career that most journalists could only dream they could attain, winning awards, covering some of the biggest stories in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, but he gave it all up. And now, yes, he's a minor league baseball <laughs> play-by-play announcer. <laughs> Why? We're about to find out. This is Life Around the Seams. Former Major League pitcher Jim Bouton once wrote, You spend a good piece of your life gripping a baseball, and in the end, it turns out, it was the other way around all the time. Welcome to Life Around the Seams, a podcast about baseball people who have interesting stories from between the lines, and sometimes even more interesting stories outside the lines. Here's your host, Josh Sushan. All right, Mike. Thanks so much for joining me. This is uh, this is really neat. Well, listen. Uh, as you know, I've told you many a year. Uh, I love coming to Albuquerque. I love John Traub, his whole operation, and the, the scenery with the mountains in the background. It's 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 a winner. So whenever I was when I was coming up with this idea, I knew I wanted to do a podcast, but I wasn't sure what was going to be the theme. And then I decided, like, I want to talk to people who work in baseball, but I want to talk about what they did before and after baseball, or what they do after the games are done. And I started to make a list of, okay, who's around me who I think is interesting that I want to talk to? And you were one of the first people that well, wrote my list. Well, I appreciate that. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's... Uh it's a blessing for me to get to do it. Okay, so I'm going to give our audience the background about Mike Caps. He was reporter, bureau chief, and executive sports director for WFAA in Dallas-Fort Worth. Among his thousands of assignments was coverage of Hurricane Alicia and covering 16 space shuttle missions. He was the assignments manager and deputy bureau chief for ABC News in St. Louis. He was the weekend anchor for KPRC in Houston. He spent five years at CNN. He covered the first Gulf War, two tours, the Midwest floods, the overthrow of the Haitian government, and the Waco siege, a national Emmy nomination for a live 10-hour-long broadcast of the fiery end of the Branch Davidian siege in Waco. It was seen by over 400 million people. The George F. Peabody Award for an investigation as a producer and Mike conducted over a three-year period that resulted in the downfall of the SMU football program. And now... Minor League Baseball play-by-play announcer. <laughs> Let's start with this. What came first, your interest in baseball or your interest in journalism? I had a chance to sign with the Montreal Expos in 1969 and did not even know it. And it, it's, I'll, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. I had run two 6-4-60s in a tryout camp for Red Murph, who had watched me since I was a sophomore in high school. Um, and I got bored waiting to hit against some of the best pitchers in Texas at this tryout camp in Brenham, Texas, and basically flipped off. Murph and his sub-scout when they wouldn't let me hit. Really? 18 years later, almost to the day, Nolan Ryan shows up in a Rangers uniform, and I'm doing a documentary on Nolan. And I remember that Red Murph, the scout, was the man who discovered Nolan and had given me my chance at a tryout camp. I called him up. He says, you know, are you any kin to Billy Caps, the Cub Scout in Dallas? I said, yeah, we're, we're cousins. We're great friends. He said, yeah, but I know you, don't I? He said, tell you what. Why don't you just meet me at the hotel tomorrow, or, or come out? I'm I'm scouting Todd Van Poppel, uh, who later signed with the Oakland A's, and he said, uh, "We'll talk." We get we go to the game, we do some tape with him at the game, scouting and talking to other scouts. Come back to the hotel, and he he's sitting about as far from uh, me as I am from you, Josh. He looks at me and he said, "You're the dumbest sob I've ever met in my life." Now, by now, we've popped the SMU football program. We've done some things. And I said, excuse me? He says, May the 29th, 1969, fire, uh, Fireman's Park in Brenham, Texas, two six four sixties and two three eights to first. Yes, sir. 
He said, what you didn't know is we were going to sign you. We didn't think you'd go through the draft. We, we, we knew we could get you under the draft because you were from such a small high school. But he said, you know what? Uh, there's another reason why you're the biggest DA in the world. There were 12 Division I college coaches asked where you went, and I couldn't tell them. So why'd you leave? I got mad because I, I, I'm a competitor. You're a competitor. We all are in this business. I wanted to hit against the best pitchers in Texas that he was auditioning for the draft, and he wasn't allowing me to do it. He was trying to keep it quiet. He didn't want anybody to know I was there. So he goes into his pocketbook and hands me a scout's card. He says, would you like to scout part-time for me? And I said, you got to be kidding me. So I did that parallel basically to my years uh, at uh, ABC and CNN. Wait, so – you're covering news stories by day and you're, or by night, and you're, co- and you're scouting amateur baseball by day. When I had a chance, I even did pro coverage. I did uh, when, he, when Red was with the Atlanta Braves, I went to Oklahoma City and sat up for three days. I had a five-day vacation at CNN, and I was looking for a first baseman when Sid Bream got hurt in the early 90s in Atlanta. And uh, I did those sorts of things, and then I helped him run off about seven tryout camps, and so it, it was, it's always been there. My, de- my grandfather was a Pirates prospect. When World War I came, they said, when you come back, we'll sign you a deal. We'll get you going. He lost hearing in an ear uh, during the Battle of the Argonne Forest in World War I. But he was a rabid, rabid Pirates fan for his entire life. And he introduced me to the game at the little rickety minor league ballpark in Dallas-Fort Worth before there ever was an Arlington Stadium. It's called Burnett Field. And uh, away I went. Okay, so I want to go back to this tryout camp. It's sure. 1969 with the Montreal Expos. How old are you? Uh, 18. Had just graduated from high school. Okay. Um, four years before that, freshman year in high school, if I would have asked you, what are you going to do with the rest of your life, what would you have said as you're an incoming freshman? Uh, baseball player. As a sophomore, I would have answered football player because I was a high school quarterback. Uh, I could throw it through a car wash and not get it wet from 40 yards and had those, had those feet. And as a sophomore, I was already getting uh, letters of inquiry from the likes of Tech and, oddly, SMU, the way it turned out, uh-huh. and, and uh, Baylor. And where I really wanted to go was Rice. Okay. And, but at six concussions later, no more football. So after the tryout camp in which you blew your chance, what do you do next? I go to junior college. Uh, I, I had two other scouts from other organizations tell me they, they didn't want me to sign four-year. They wanted to, to watch me semester by semester and in texas in those days we played a 60 game fall schedule and a 70 game spring set schedule so you really got to play a lot of baseball yeah. and and i really improved as a baseball player those those two semesters how close did you come to getting another chance with the expos or somebody else i really didn't because uh i had mononucleosis my freshman year uh, the second half of my freshman year and and it lasted through the summer and i played in a real fast uh you you'd if you saw the play in those years, you would think it was independent ball. There were It was me as a high school kid and about six other high school kids mixed in with some ex-major leaguers, some ex-triple-A, double-A guys, and it was fast. It was some fast baseball, and it was all a kid from a Class 2A school in Texas could do to keep up with that. But it was what a learning experience, Seven, 70 games during the summer doing that. Wow. So then when does when do you get the journalism bug? Um, sophomore year in college – uh, I already know that I have a really low draft number at Vietnam, and I have to I have to really make some grades here. And I got into a journalism class, and uh, with other with two other baseball players, and we scouted out. They wanted us to do a term project. They wanted us to write for a local newspaper, and there were about six local newspapers around Hillsborough, Texas, where I went to junior college. Slammed the door in our faces. So we're out having a couple of pops after after baseball practice, and I see the, t- the uh, radio station antenna off in the distance. I said, boys, get in the car. We're going over there. We march in this radio station, Josh, and say hello to the general manager. I know who you are. I see your pictures in the paper, baseball players. Yeah, yeah. I said, well, we're in a journalism uh, situation, and we really need to, to work as interns for you. Get out. Or, excuse me? I said, get out. I have got no room for you. I said, look, here's the deal. We were, I'm telling you, get out. This went on for about five minutes, and finally I said, look, we're sports guys. We'll do it for free. Free got us in. Okay. So the ne- this, is, this is Thursday, so he's got a two-hour hole on Saturday mornings, and we have to produce a sports talk show. <laughs> Three guys, 19 years old, have no more business, and, and you know what? We pulled it off. 
we just read some wire copy and took some phone calls from from some of the folks around Hillsboro, and uh, it, it, that's that got me off baseball, and I ended up going to Sam Houston State and uh, radio station work, radio play by play, uh, radio news, uh, all sorts of different coverages and radio in a, in a little small town, Hillsboro, Texas is where the state prison is. Bill Mercer, my, my 92 year old buddy who was the Rangers original voice said, every time he introduces me at a speech or something, he says, and Mike has the honor of having gone to the better of the two institutions in Huntsville, Texas. <laughs> so that's it. so uh, by the time I get done at Sam Houston State, I basically have three and a half years of professional experience. So I'll make the jump to a major market by the time I'm 23 years old. Okay, so there's a lot of us who get into sports because we played sports, whether yes, you played right. 10 years in the major leagues or whether you played college or whether you flamed exactly. out in the little league, and but you stay in sports. What was it about you that said, no, not sports, but news? Um, it, you, it, it, small town, inadequate feelings. My dad was uh, friends with the news director and uh, Bill Mercer, who was a news reporter as well as a sports broadcaster, and a fellow named... Um, uh, well, nonetheless, three or four guys. Bob Huffaker was the fellow's name. And Bob Huffaker was the guy you saw in, in during the Kennedy assassination in the Dallas police station uh, garage when when uh, Oswald was shot. They were all when Kennedy was assassinated. We were at my grandparents' house in Dallas, and. My dad calls down to talk to his friends down at Channel 4 and tell them, hey, you're doing a great job. They say, you got Mike with you. He says, bring him down. Josh, I walk into this newsroom that's three times the size of this press box. It was utter chaos. It's the first time I ever met Dan Rather. Uh, this is the day after Kennedy had been shot and killed. And I walked in there, and I, I felt a certain peace. And I was later told by Bob Huffaker, who passed away here a couple of months ago, he said, you know, this... Uh, uh, this 12 year old kid you was amazing he said you kept asking these questions and i they these guys had been to my dad's uh cattle ranch to deer hunt and just hang out since i was nine years old so they knew me well and and, and they were all sort of blown away by it we're coming out my dad said you know you might be able to do this someday and i said no no i'm going to play baseball uh, kids from a town of 1500 just don't have these kinds of jobs my dad died four years and a month after that visit. Two years and a month after that visit, I did my first radio news broadcast. <laughs> so you, <laughs> when, you, when you're 12, you don't know Jack. And sometimes I think when I'm 67, I don't know Jack. But there's somewhere in the middle you meet and f figure out what you're supposed to do. So what would be the first sort of, quote, big break, professional job where you're getting paid, you don't have to go to school? Was that the, um, was that the NBC affiliate in Houston? Yeah, I was at, a, I was at the CBS affiliate in, in Beaumont, Texas, doing jack-of-all-trades news, anchored uh, weekends and night newscasts and, and put pieces together and uh, had two or three really good mentors there. And had a chance to go to work for a guy named Ray Miller. If you do a Google on him, he 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 was one of the greatest news directors of all time, and and I was so overmatched in that market. And he was a submarine captain in World War II, and he was a firebrand. I mean, wild man. He's the only major market news director I ever knew in the 22 years I was in that business that that ran his own assignments desk as well as doing all the other things a news director has to do and there are a myriad of jobs but he never we never miss a story and and he and hired me and that was that was like man i had died and gone to heaven i'm going to work for ray miller in in houston and what do you learn from him what do you learn from ray miller uh keeping the passion going keeping your ears to the ground and your legs running all the time and i i was a 23 year old cop beat reporter in Houston, Texas, in the days that they were throwing Hispanic, the police were throwing Hispanics into bios and going into federal court and spending federal prison time and all sorts of police corruption and, oh, God, 800 murders a year in Houston in those years and blood and guts piles up in all this. And so that, that's that. But it was a huge break in terms of that. 
And then what comes next? WFAA in Dallas or the ABC News? A brief stint at an all-news radio station in St. Louis. Okay. And I was a, uh, covered politics a lot. And that, that played well later on in life. Then WFAA in Dallas, off okay. and on for 10 years. Okay. So this is, I want to start to get into the SMU. But before that, set the scene for what is local TV news like in the, this would be the early 80s, right? This is, this is, this is great import to people in those days. We had a th- at WFAA's terrific operation. A fellow named Marty Haig, a former CBS operative, ran it. And he ran it like the networks. I mean, we took Lear jets across country to cover major stories. So by the time I got to the network at CNN, I'd already done that stuff and knew how to do it. But Marty was a stickler for detail. And, and Marty, Marty ran a newspaper newsroom for television. You had beats you had to cover. I had space and and uh, the executions at uh, Huntsville, Huntsville prison stuff. And, and it, we had, I counted up the other day, 22 people from that newsroom, that era, that those 10 years, ended up, well, Scott Pelley, the, the longtime CBS anchor, was from that place. Uh, 22 people who were significant names in network news in, in those days. Just such a different way of doing business in those days we had a 35 to 40 percent share of the audience and now uh local news is grubbing for eight and ten percent to be the top dog wow that's really different times yeah different times all right so the smu for people who don't know they were paying players a lot of money (laughs) they kept paying players a lot of money what was what was your first inclination that there's something here and we need to investigate a producer and I worked this out. Uh, his name is John Sparks. He, he and I are still great friends to this day. He had had a quiet tip from a friend of his that we needed to start looking at this. Um, I had some dear friends who played in that era at SMU, or just slightly before that era, and they were embarrassed at what was going on. It was widely no SMU had been paying players and doing those kinds of things since 1959 in the era of Coach Bill Meek, and they had had more sanctions than any other team. And uh, we found out about a player who had a brand new car. His parents had a new house built down in Beaumont, and I went down and I had I had this guy locked and gone. And our the lawyer for our our TV station WFAA. Watched the feed. I had this thing triple source, not double source, triple source. And and he watched the feed, and I hear him in the background saying, no, no, no. He nixed it. So that particular piece that would have gotten them the death penalty in 1983 went away. In 1980, late 86, as I was going to work at ABC, we got him. Whole series of... of pieces fell into place was a uh, linebacker for SMU named David Stanley that showed us his entire cadre of envelopes with handwritten notes from coaches we did all sorts of handwriting samples and this sort of thing just to lock it down backing up in 87 when the NCAA had everybody come into Kansas City for meeting out this death penalty the third of ten banned boosters out of that room was the lawyer who nixed my first story. Really? Yes. So we went to outside counsel when that that lawyer nixed the story, and that's the only way we were able to do this. So that was one of the things that I was going to ask you about is how much pressure within the newsroom, outside the newsroom, neighbors, friends, people like, hey, come on, Mike, I know you got a job to do, but Texas does the same thing. Oklahoma does the same thing. Nebraska does the same thing. A&M does the same thing. What? You know, lay off. We had dossiers on all of those guys, all of them. Uh, the Oklahoma quarterback who sold who sold cocaine and had a machine gun in his back. Well, we we knew all about that. And once that came, SMU came tumbling down. The producer and I went to the bosses and said and said we got to continue to do this because we we're, we're on the trail of making something positive happen in big time college sports. They didn't have the stomach for it. Yeah, I had I had friends, SMU backers. I had seventeen death threats. Seventeen death threats. Yes, the, the FBI even had a uh, a wiretap on my home phone so they could trace the calls. 
all hours of the day and night. We, we hear about how much football matters in Texas. Is, is uh-huh. this just Texas football, or no. is there something else that, that's going on here? With it's 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 well, what are we seeing with Urban Meyer right now? What do we see uh, with his predecessor? And it's not I'm not just picking on Ohio State. There there is a culture in especially in college sports. Uh, if you've ever dealt, dealt with any college coaches, and I know some who are great, and I know some who are absolute bears to deal with, there is an atmosphere of I am the king, and you are my subjects, and you need me, and I don't need you. And once you've built up that power with million-dollar contracts and, and, and kids, whether they like it or not, they're still getting paid. And once that is in place, it's a juggernaut. And I really, honest to God, Josh, believe, had we been allowed to continue on, there would have been some major changes. Maybe the NCAA would have gone away, and maybe there would have been uh, another kind of entity to, to watch over this humongous, multi-billion dollar business of college sports. Bottom line, it didn't happen, and we still got it. How many years did you spend? Was it three years working on the SMU Three store? hard years. Was there other assignments that you had in that yeah. time as well? So this yeah. is like a side project as you're yeah. doing your daily beat. Yeah, but it was it, it, it dominated what we did. I mean, uh, I can't tell you how many man hours we spent on that, but it was a, 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 it was a load. A yeah. load, yeah. What's the long t- what, what are you most proud of from that story, from the SMU story? The fact that SMU – had to, it, a lot of things that uh, were the culture of that school were exposed. I mean, the governor of the state of Texas' wife was on the board of regents, and and he was such a nabob. He came. Our Austin reporter caught him on the steps of the Capitol and said, "Governor, what about these payments?" He says, "While well, we owed him the money, <laughs> holy crap! I mean, it really." <laughs> I remember watching the um, the it ESPN is the culture thir- in Texas. Yeah, yeah, the the ESPN thirty for thirty, the Pony Express was was fascinating because they got busted and they kept paying them afterwards because I guess I guess they were on long term contracts and yes. they had to keep paying them. Yeah, yeah. You know, Craig James always said that he made more money at SMU than he made his first three years with the New England Patriots. Uh, I, I find that ESPN thirty story interesting in that. We were never approached. John Sparks and I were never approached to interview for that story. And guys who had real no real role in breaking it. And then we find out the guy who filmed it is an SMUX. Really? Yes. So not saying there are conspiracy theories anywhere, but I just thought it was funny. Uh, the guy who was a sports anchor at, at FAA is interviewed, and he had he had an ancillary role, but he he had come over from the CBS affiliate two years before. Had he not, he would have never touched that story. Yeah. Um, so when do you go to CNN? In June of 1990, just in time to hook them up and head to Saudi Arabia. Okay. What is – give us both the – within the industry and outside the industry, what is CNN's reputation at that point? Because they started, I think, in 1980. 1980. Uh, they're 10 years in. I had a, I had had a chance to meet Ted Turner, 80, 81, 82, somewhere. Uh, he came into Dallas and came into WFA and had a chance to visit with him at, at great length and really came to admire him and his tenacity for really wanting straight news, no guff. And by the time I came there – I mean, if you went overseas, what you got English-wise was CNN. That was a great news mission. By the time I left in late 94, early 95, um, burned out, and we can talk about that later. But the bottom line was they'd already started uh, talk shows and infotainment, and they, to me, really had gotten away. They'd, they'd come back to it, thank God, somewhat but had gotten away from the 24-hour news clock where we, we had no deadlines. As soon as you can source it, double source it, make it happen, it's running. Mm-hmm. And to me, that was the best of all news radio that I'd experienced for a year in St. Louis and television news that I'd experienced in Dallas-Fort Worth. Now, it, was, it, 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 it caused a lot of divorces, two for me. The other side of it was we didn't miss anything. And and I, going overseas, Josh, was just amazing. Not recognized that much coming off airplanes. 
in the U.S. every now and again. Amsterdam, London, Paris, everywhere I came off, people would say, are you, are you going in or coming back from covering the war? What, what's going on? And just sort of glom onto you. And it was just, it was the most amazing thing. And I, I, I never got into the business for the heroism or to be recognized or anything like that. And to this day, I'm uncomfortable when somebody says, wait a minute. And they still do. And I've not been in that business since 1994, for all intents and purposes. But it's, I'm proud of those years because it really, it really is what we do in a minor league booth. It's the same skill set. The same exact skill set. We research, we spew. We research, we spew. At the end of the day, nobody's going to die in what we're doing up here in the minor league booth. Uh, and it's going to be, for me, a whole lot more mentally healthy than, than that was. And I had some real huge problems at the end of the news career. Okay, so let's go to the start of CNN. You said you get there, and pretty soon you're on a plane to go to Saudi Arabia. Do you get? Do you volunteer? Are you told? Are you nudged heavily that you're going to get on this plane and go cover this war, or what? Well, you know, the first three months I was there, June, July, and August, I was running back and forth between Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and Wichita, Kansas, covering the abortion, anti-abortion battles. And there were some vicious, and, and that, the, that whole scene was... And I got a call from Ed Turner, no relation to Ted, who was running the day-to-day -day news operation at CNN. And he said, well, what are your thoughts on going overseas? And I said, if you're talking about going to the Gulf, let's go. And it was not a question of anything other than yes. Put me down. So I remember being a high school senior and watching CNN's coverage of the first Gulf War being mesmerized. And what I also remember is my dad telling me, we've never seen this before. We have never seen a war live like this, like we were watching. I remember him saying, like, this is historic what we are watching. When you were over there, did you realize just how historic your coverage was for us back in the United States? You know, Josh, when you are in any kind of live news situation, you really don't. You're, you have, you're so uber focused on what you're trying to do that moment it's about a series of moments and you really don't you really don't get a sense of anything other than hey i got through another one um i wasn't on the floor during those 44 hours i was, I was up in the mountains of northern iraq with the refugees who had been run out of those towns and raped and plundered by uh, saddam hussein's soldiers but I saw worse activity up there. The British Royal Marines we were attached to. Nobody was embedded like they were in the in the in the Second Gulf War. Um, but we were with the British Royal Marines, and they trained the Peshmerga, uh, the uh, young Iraqi militia, to fight guerrilla. And they'd run night raids, and they'd crawl in on their bellies and steal munitions from the Iraqis and shoot them up, boy. And it was wild times so describe where is it that you stay and i mean obviously if you're over there you're basically reporting 24 7 but where do you stay where do you go like for someone who has no idea how to cover a war like kind of give us sort of a an insight i know that every day is probably going to be a little bit different but well i was over there for three months in, in the run-up to it and i was assigned to the dahran air force base in saudi arabia and we went out on military sorties as they were as they were planning uh, and staging what was going to happen or what they thought would happen. And uh, the hotel where we were staying was three clicks away from a hotel in, uh, in uh, Bahrain, and it was hit by a Scud missile, and 33 Pennsylvania uh, National Guards men and women were killed, and they were aiming for our uh, CNN hotel three miles away, three clicks away. And so, but what you're doing every day, uh, there's a conference call between Atlanta and those of us in that hotel, and we have assignments, and we go out and do them. We were, uh, uh, we were out in the desert for two nights with uh, a bunch of shavetail Marines who were dug in, and I, I would assume, knowing where they were, that they were neck deep in it within six weeks of when we talked to them. Um, we did stories on preparation for the Saudi people, 
and how they were coping with knowing that they were right smack in the middle of what was going to happen. Uh, the same thing with with uh, Iraqi people. We talked to them. It was it was just p piecing this together, and in doing that, it became clear when all the shooting started and continued on until the day I left um, that this was going to be run and gun journalism at its very, very best. My other thought is, and I always keep this in mind nowadays, when we get information so quickly from Twitter and from, from our phones, from, from everywhere, there's no internet then. There's, there, you don't have cell phones that's going to give you this information. How much are you aware of what else is going on in the Gulf War while you're working on your own assignment quite a bit because we're briefed every day before we go out by by uh, by atlanta okay so we were and, and plus you got to remember we were around the bbc we were around cbc we were around sky news we were around six or eight different really legit uh journalistic operations there in that dahran hotel and we all talked and all uh, visited and shared information because we, nobody had been through this before. And uh, uh, everybody but the Scud Stud from NBC. Right. And he was on his own little trip around the universe or some bunch of crap. I never saw anything like it. But but it, it, and and it really it really worked well. There was a lot of a lot of unity and a lot of uh, cheering each other on, basically. So you had two different tours. Describe when you come back to the United States in between, how much does this start to take a, a toll on you physically, mentally, psychologically, what you just witnessed and reported on? It didn't much, and I'll tell you why. They, they kept us busy. I was running back and forth between uh, Dallas and um, Fort Hood where uh, the 1st uh, Cavalry was based, and those were the tankers that went over. And we did piece after piece on the readiness of the tankers to take on so by the time the tankers were leaving, I was leaving to go back. So I was maybe back 10 days before I went back again. I was there a total of eight months, and it was um, just wild. Wild. What, are, what, else from, what else made it wild that I've not asked you about that stands out the most about those two tours, eight months? The last day. Tell me about that. 20 of us, and the same bunch I mentioned we had we had heard reports from the Americans and from from um, the British Royal Marines that uh, a northern Iraqi town was being liberated uh, about 50 miles north of where we were so we all pile in the cars and head out and we find this town but it's surrounded that they have four guards up at the entrance of the town and they turn us around now we're wondering what the hell we get back out to the road and we're all huddled up and two two big vans full of republican guards surround us soldiers jump out they've got their ak's they got bayonet, bayonets right here bayonet right to the throat and i'm thinking i'm looking up to the stars and i'm i'm saying to god really the last day I'm in theater, and I'm going to get it in the throat. Couldn't you just put me away in a firefight or something, man? Not to the throat. Come on. Over the hill came two A-10 Warthogs, the, the anti-tank planes, heavily armored. And they buzz these guys. They haul it. We get on the road. I'd already been assigned to drive to Ankara and then to Istanbul and get on a plane and come home. And that's exactly what my crew and me did. Wow. And I did. That was close. <laughs> <laughs> was there any others that were cl that were just as close? Not really, not really, because uh, um, one of the things when you go on one of those firefights, we were far enough back. I mean, you, you know, could hear it and, and 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 see it to a certain extent, but it was at night. So, um, and, and tell you the truth, I saw as vicious a combat in the streets of Houston as a 23-year-old going on uh, two dozen narcotics raids because that was a wild place in those days. And, and the ACLU had moved in and uh, said to the Houston Police Department, you, you guys are way too rough on drug raids. So 
me and another couple of guys from different stations were allowed to go on all these drug raids and we get a call and away we go man knock over methamphetamine labs knock over cocaine dealers and bullets flying all over the place yeah all right let's talk about waco siege uh, uh -huh. i've actually been trying to read a book by one of the survivors and i keep getting annoyed by things so i keep putting it down <laughs> um how long is it between the time that you finished the gulf war and your initial coverage of the waco siege okay so we came back from from turkey in late May, early June of 91. And that that Waco siege was in February, of, it started in February of 93. So I, I'm, okay. you know, I'm doing a lot of different stuff then. All over, Midwest floods, you know, in, in 92 and, uh, you know, just wreaked such havoc. I'm, I'm, I averaged 250 days a year gone and I was based in Dallas. Okay. 300 was my big year. And I think the minor league baseball schedule is rough. No, this is – I well, I did tell you a quick snippet about that. Yeah. Uh, Travis Driscoll's first year with us in 2005, uh, AAA, we were in Iowa. And this is like three months into the season. And and he and four or five other veteran guys are sitting in the airport, and they're bitching and moaning about traveling to PCL and this and that and the other. I said, boys, let me tell you what travel, what travel really is. Get on – a 747 in Dallas-Fort Worth, fly 26 hours into a war zone, stay eight months, work 17 on and seven off every day without a day off. Then tell me about PCL travel. You know what? Driscoll to this day is one of my great friends, and he's no, he, he moved to Plano, so he's not doing color for me at home anymore. But he's just he, every now and again he'll crank me and say, Okay, okay, I don't want to hear about PCL travel. I'll say, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> uh, when was the first that you hear about David Crash and the Branch Davidians and what's going on outside of Waco? I am putting a friend on an airplane at Love Field in Dallas at uh, 11.30 a.m. on that Sunday morning that it broke. And uh, I go back to my apartment. I pack up. I don't know how long I'm going to be gone. It was a good thing that I packed really heavily. Um, I walk onto this McAdam Road near the the scene, and I'm met by a, a dear friend of mine who used to be the uh, chief of the Oklahoma Bureau of Investigation, who now is, is a wheel at the FBI. And this is two and a half, three hours after the siege. It took me about two hours to drive down from Dallas. And he says, Cappy, you're not going to believe this. He said, this is a liar's convention. He said, they're planning to have news conferences every day at 10 a.m. And he said, you come see me after every one of them. And he, he guided us through that. He was the guy that helped us with all our logistics and knowing where to be at what time and this sort of thing. And thank God for him. Because yeah. he, without without that fellow, we would have been like most everybody thought they had a handle on what really was happening. But there And there are so many books, Josh, out about this. And there's so much that's that's incorrect about it. Just uh, people thought they know knew, and and they talked to different sides of the, of the branch and the Davidians, and they're different. And the whole thing was just a wild circus. Did you ever go inside the compound? Did you ever get inside it? Never did. Um, after the ten hour end to it, I walked up the McAdam Road. We were probably a quarter of a mile away and uh dan rather grabbed me pulled gave me a big hug uh, dan and i went to sam houston state and so we were longtime friends peter jennings the same um peter knew me because i did a couple of stories on world news tonight local correspondents didn't get on there and i, I had a chance to be on there and, and peter and i had a real good friendship too and he said just awesome he said we've been watching it's crazy and you know what i thought I thought, damn it, I missed opening day. <laughs> I'm serious. As I'm walking through there. Now, now I'm, I'm stunned because I see this place, and I'm thinking about these kids, these 87 people who died. And it wasn't two months later. I woke up, or three months later, I woke up with a bedpost in my hand, and I busted my head wide open. Hold on. You had a bedpost in your hand? Yeah, I grabbed a bedpost in the middle of the night in a night sweat and busted my head. There's a hole right here. And that's because you were dreaming that you were 
still I, in it, or is this PTSD, it, or what is this? It's it's nobody in '93. Nobody was really t- calling it PTSD, but I, it, I had all of it. I was as dark a soul as you'd ever want to meet. I had a precursor to it two weeks before. I was doing a light little feature story in the mountains in Colorado. 80-year-old ladies doing morning drive radio. I thought it was one of the funniest things I'd ever seen, and she just had a great audience, and I was sitting in a beauty shop. And the lady here on the beauty shop came over to me, and she said, Mr. Camps, I watched you cover the Gulf War. I saw you in Waco. And she said, you, you are the darkest soul I've ever seen. The darkest soul. That's what she said, her exact words. And I said, well, excuse me. You know, and I'm thinking, I've never made this much money in my life. You know, I'm set. I don't have to worry about anything, blah, blah, blah. And she's saying this to me. And I'm going, well, the hell with that. <laughs> and you know what? God is my witness. Head gets busted open. And if you think there's not a God in heaven, the guy who was my therapist was a four-tour of duty side gunner on a copter in Nam and a licensed Presbyterian lay minister. Now, that's a powerful combination. And I had, Josh, I had to break it down and start all over. I was raised a Methodist and had gotten so far away from just basic faith that Methodism is. Um, and now Karen and I are just loyal. Every Sunday we can be there, Methodists, and reveling in that faith and reveling in it. Karen knew me before all this stuff happened, and we, we weren't married, but she knew me. And she just re- marvels in the difference in me in those dark days and in now. What would be an example of your dark days? Would that just be the way that you approached people, the way that you thought? The, like, the way, the way, Yeah, and the way people thought about me. You know, you're in a news reporter situation. It's it 99 times out of 100. It's not that happy feature in the mountains north of Denver. It's it's some confrontational kind of thing. Well, that wears on you. You watch a lot of people die. That wears on you, and it builds up. Well, I had two or three different ways of attacking it involving alcohol or drugs, and none of that works. And we just had to break it down to the basics and go, go back. And mentally, I mean, emotionally it was like somebody just popped slowly a huge mental zit before I, I felt free in my head it took a long time how long from the time that you wake up with the bedpost in your hand to the time that you decide to leave tv journalism uh that would be i, I would have left immediately had we not had two daughters in college and another one coming uh but i had i, I had to hang in there and, and it progressively got worse but fortunately i was doing therapy on the side and 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 i just was realizing and the waco thing was such a wake-up call to to how this looking at at these nasty blood and guts things was affecting me and not and just shoving it aside until this this one moment in time and and uh, the therapist and just reworking and rebuilding. I couldn't be in baseball had I been that dark soul. There's no doubt about it. You had mentioned earlier how you were still doing some baseball scouting. So in between Waco and Iraq and um, Haitian government being overthrown, when are you still getting out to be able to, to watch Every baseball scouting? Every chance I got. Really? Brad Murphy and I stayed in close touch. I called him from Saudi Arabia all the time. Um, and I got to a point when I came back from – from the Gulf War, I said to him, at some point, I'm going to quit this, and you and I are going to write a book. And in 1994, I quit, uh, started the book in early 95. It was finished in September of 95, and we published it in 96. And it was in 96 when we were in Arizona at Bob Starr's broadcast booth, the late, great Bob Starr, one of the most wonderful gentlemen I ever met. Red's being interviewed, promoting the book. And I hear this voice in my head says, you can do this. You can do this. I hear this, honest to God. And in between innings, I say to Bob Starr, I'm 45 years old. Am I too old to get started? He's your puppy. Two phone calls later, I get a job with the Tyler Wildcatters in the independent Texas-Louisiana League. And the next year I'm doing uh, 144 games in the American Association with Steve Selby in Nashville and Away we go. Away we go. <laughs> what Before we talk about that, your last day, I guess this would be at CNN. Did anyone put a gun to your throat the last no, day No, CNN? no, was the last no. Day like it, it was contentious because I'd, uh, w- we, had, uh, we had some contractual things going. And, 
and uh, the bosses where I was based had it, there was some stuff that that we had to get ironed out legally, and so getting get, getting that all taken care of was was uh, it had him out to setting myself free. And by January the first of ninety five, I was done with it. So once you start doing baseball now, how long does it take before you feel like I'm no longer this dark soul? I think the cathartic part of this is writing the book and being around the old scouts in Texas in those times uh, and many of them including my cousin Billy were huge in this and showing me this different way of life and uh, Billy Caps was one of my heroes in, in my life and I did his eulogy in 2000 when he passed away at age 88 or something but um, one of these guys that Loved every moment. He was at a ballpark. He was a player, a manager, and then a scout. And then I met five or six other guys, the same thing. And Red was one of those. And uh, I, I just drew such strength out of their friendship. And they were so encouraging, not only with a book, but, but with once they found out I was going to broadcast, they were just excited beyond belief. And it's that gave you the impetus and... Uh, it, it, you really, I really realized at that point that I was beginning to heal. How long before you felt like a, you, you said that you I had this voice that said you can do this? When do you feel like I'm good at this? Um, I guess after the '97 season, I got in with a couple of producers from ESPN Radio, and this was in the days when actually minor league broadcasters were asked to do fill-in ESPN radio games until all the anchors at ESPN, their agents figured out that they could get them on those instead of these guys from the minor leagues. Uh, I, I think after I did my first ESPN game, I, I finally realized it, but I knew I, had, I still had a lot of work to do. Explain the Ryan family and the Round Rock Express, how this came together. As we have a great, massive thunder in the background What a right great now. story. What a great story. Um, it basically came, I, I was in Alvin, Texas, doing a documentary on Nolan, which led me to Red Murph. Uh, so all the worlds are starting to shape up years before it happened. But before that, I had met a fellow named Jay Miller, who was a longtime president of the Round Rock Express, now the president of an independent team down in Sugar Land, Texas. And met him in the early 80s, along with Sandy Johnson and Marty Scott. Marty was a former farmer director of the Miami Marlins. Uh, Sandy was assistant GM and later a special assistant to the GM of the Mets. And they would call me while I was working at WFAA, and I, I, had, I was in management then. They'd say, who are you pissed off at today? <laughs> and I'd tell them, and they'd say, come on over, we're having beers. So there my baseball brotherhood is, and to this day they're still there. And Jake, I told Jay I was getting out of the news business, and he said, "Well, I'm, I'm, you need to stay in touch with me." So we we kept talking to each other, and he called me in in uh, early '97, and he said, "You want to come down to New Orleans and be the number two radio broadcaster?" And I said, "Well, I already got a job in Quad Cities, Astros Low A." He said, "Think about it. Just think about it." So get to Quad Cities, and the owner bounced a couple of paychecks, and I end up in Nashville. And Jay calls me in early 98, and he says, I want you to stay in touch. There's some stuff going on in Texas. And I'm living in New York City by this time. And so in... Now, when you say you're living in New York City, let me pause you. I, an ex-wife had a PR business, and she moved it up there to grow it. And it, it was spectacular. Okay. I, lo I love New York City. Just so that's your main it. income. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then baseball is your fun summertime yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so uh, but but... There, there's some other stuff that went in there, but it's not ancillary to the story. But here, here, long story short, Jay's friendship was, and and he calls he calls me in Manhattan where I live, and he says, "Hey, uh, what do you think about Round Rock, Texas?" I said, "I think it's 15 miles north of Austin. That's <laughs> what I think." He said, "I'm going there." I said, "Well, what the hell for?" I said, you got a triple-A job. Well, well, we're buying a team in the Texas League, and we'll move it to the Round Rock. I said, why do you want to jump back from triple-A today? Trust me, this is a great thing, he says. Do you want to 
meet me at the winter meetings. This is in November, and the winter meetings are in December. He said, I'll reintroduce you to Reed, and, and we'll talk about it. So I had been hired by the Round Rock Express in 98 and still had to have a job in 99 in the Independent Atlantic League before I started down there in 2000. And that's the substance of it. I mean, I knew Nolan a little bit through the years, and, and I watched Reed pitch in high school during, doing that documentary. So it was – it was a pretty easy fit, quite honestly. And, and you know, they're still rocking and rolling down there in Round Rock, and Jay's doing what he does. And, uh, and Reed's the president of the Houston Astros. Houston Astros, business operations president. And uh, Reese, the youngest brother, is the, is the CEO of Ryan Sanders Baseball. And they're still pushing and shoving and getting it done. How many baseball games do you think you've called now? Okay, uh, I can I can come close because I had my 2,500th in Round Rock in June of last year, and I had okay I had three seasons before that of at least 140 games, and I got 3,300. Yeah, 3,300. Yeah. How many live hits do you think you did for CNN in those five years? Uh, probably 2,000. 2,000. I was on the Larry King show like 47 times in the Midwest floods alone. Wow. Every night almost. And you mentioned this earlier, but a lot of the skills transfer over. You're basically breaking news every second. That's right. You're constantly breaking news and you're giving background information and statistical background of what's going on out there. And telling stories. But no one's dying. No. And that's the happy part of it. That's why I always tell people, and Reese Ryan winces every time he hears me say this, and I said it in a speech in front of him one day, and I can see him. He's sitting right down, right close. And somebody it was question and answer, and I, somebody, I recognize this guy. Said, what can I do for you? He said, what is it exactly you do? And I said, what does a baseball announcer do? I said, I steal money for a living. <laughs> and Reese is going, ugh. And, and, and I said, no, it's theft of services. I said, whenever you show up at a gig and it's not work, it's the most fun thing you've ever done in your life. And you would fight to keep it. And you're happier than you've ever been. And people that you know and love are happier with you than they've ever been. You're on the right track. What do you miss about being a television reporter or radio reporter or newspaper reporter? Not one damn thing. <laughs> and you know, it, it, this is this is a funny story. And and when the Oklahoma City bombing came up, it was less than six months after I had stopped it. I'm sitting on the exercise bike. This is right before we moved to to New York. And I have a pager, kept a pager, so people, my, my girls could get in touch with me. And and so I kept the pagers going off like crazy. And, and of course, they've got the TV sets on, and I'm seeing what's going on. Four networks and two newspapers called wanting to know if I would go produce in Oklahoma City. And all four, I'm giggling, saying, uh-uh, I'm not going to do it. Was there even a tiny part of no. you that was, no, no, you were done? No, I swear to you, I, I, I walked away, and uh, this is in the afternoon, I believe. I went and had a beer, and I thought, thank you, God. I really did. <laughs> I, I want, I'm on, I, if it's the last thing I do, I'm going to find at least one positive thing about being a journalist. Um, oh, there's plenty. Oh, I know. But let me ask you this. Okay, in the minor leagues, one of the best parts about our job is that someone gets called up to the major leagues, and especially when it's the first time and it never gets old, of seeing the joy in that kid and his mom and his dad and his teammates and his friends and everyone, he gets called up to the major leagues. What was a news story that you covered that always made you feel good? Um, golly. That's a great question. Uh, I think at least one of them was uh, one of the. This is this is a series of moments during the Midwest floods because we were live all the time, and I mean, I, I never, I never saw Dallas, Texas, at all that whole summer. So I'm 160 days out. It would have to be people coming up to me in Des Moines, Iowa, in in uh, in. Uh, all along the Mississippi River in St. Louis. Thank you, thank you, thank you for 
is standing down there and explaining where this water is, where it's going, how we're going to be affected. People are touched by that kind of thing. Um, I'll tell you another one that really touched me. Uh, hurricane and probably 2000, no, it would have been 96, 90, 93, 93. I've always, even in my days at Channel 2, I always covered hurricanes. I just had a, an instinctive feel for them and, and knowing where to go. I always wanted to find a five- or six-year-old and tell a story through his eyes, and I found him. Seth St. Martin was his name uh, from South Louisiana. And we mic'd him up, and I talked to him and let him walk us around. And uh, and he was a little Cajun guy, and he'd say, "This is where my this is where my room was, but it ain't here anymore." And and people, this was a three minute piece that played constantly. A lady in Pennsylvania saw the devastation, saw the story, and the the one of the Philadelphia crews ran out and, and visited with her, and this got on the network, and she said. We love him. We we know Mike Caps has Pennsylvania roots, which I do. But we love the way he just let this kid tell the story. So I own this um, manufacturing firm for uh, mobile homes. We are floating 700 mobile fl mobile homes down the river to that town, Franklin, Louisiana. 700 <laughs> as a result of that story. That's pretty profound. And you know what? I thought, it's what you're supposed to be doing. Right. So. That's journalism. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what, that's, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it, and, and people appreciate that kind of thing. And, and I think, uh, not to get totally political, I, I, I think at some point, um, people who run network newsrooms and who run local television newsrooms are going to need to stand up in this day and age and really stand up for what what the founding fathers intended the fourth and fifth estates to be I, I believe that I had a few other questions but that's a really good place to end <laughs> well it's fun all right I can't resist what is a non-baseball sporting event that you would most love to do play-by-play -play for um non baseball sporting event well I I did the Dallas sidekicks indoor soccer league until I realized that if you sit in the arena in Wichita and it's 10 degrees below zero and you can't see the numbers, you better invent somebody really quick <laughs> who's going to be the star of the game. And I did. And and then the sidekicks had some financial problems. And I was making 400 bucks a night doing those games, and I really liked that money. But they decided they were going to do just every home game instead of all the games. And so that, that basically went away. But that's probably just as good – just – just as well it didn't stay. <laughs> Let's go back to the beginning. Let's if go. you had not left that Expos tryout camp, if you had just been a little bit more patient and not so stubborn. i got to think about this all the time. Where, What would be different <laughs> in your life? Uh, my whole life. And, and I'll, I will tell you this, and, and I believe this, and, and Karen knows this, and my kids know this, and my all my grandkids know this. My dad was the – least little league father you'd ever want to see but he did go with with me to several tryout camps had he not died the year before this tryout camp when i was 17 years old we would have sat there he would have made me sit there and then after that you can only dream a dream and see what would have happened i, I think with my ties to billy caps and ultimately to red murph and all these wonderful scouts I think it it would have been a baseball life, and it wouldn't have been a bad life. It just would. It just it would have been taken you so long to get into this baseball. That's life. right. That's right. But you know, isn't it? To me, I wake up every day thanking God above that this is what I get to go do, and and I I think I have, honest to God, Josh, I think I have a different appreciation for it had I gone about it a different way. Even when there's a three hour rain delay, I don't care about that. Hey, we're all. You know what happens up here? People That's need right. this is like making sausage up here. Exactly. If you can't take a rip in this business and you can't go in the PA announcer's room and rip on them and down in the scouts room and rip on them and you know, go down in the clubhouse and rip on them and let them rip you back. 
that's not a good life that, without that. Exactly. You, see, you don't walk into the governor of Louisiana's mansion and start ripping on him if you're seeing CNN correspondent. <laughs> he probably needs it. <laughs> right. Don't He needs it more but, than Jason Wood needs it. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. Boy, he's such a wonderful guy. You guys were so lucky to have had him here in Albuquerque. Yeah. We're so lucky to have him around. He's just the best. You're the best. Thank you yeah. for this time. This was awesome. Loved it. That's Mike Caps. This is Life Around the Seams.